Hi, I'm Michelle Cusolito, a former elementary school teacher and National Board Certified Teacher, and now a children's book author. I'm making this video in March of 2020 because many students and teachers are now home due to the spread of the COVID-19 virus, and lots of authors have gotten together to create some mini lessons and read alouds to help educators and students while they're home. Today, I'd like to share some examples of how you can add more sensory details to your writing. Um, I'm going to include some examples and then there will be some exercises for you to do. So you wanna be prepared. You'll need to have a piece of paper or a notebook and a pen or a pencil. And I'm going to, I like to include lots of sensory details in my writing. And today I'm going to especially focus on the use of sound. I'm going to use my book, Flying Deep, to share some examples of my own work and give um, and show how my the use of sound words can help readers feel like they're inside Alvin. Okay, so my book is called Flying Deep, Climb Inside Deep Sea Submersible Alvin. And you can see on the cover right here, Alvin is a small submarine that carries three people to the seafloor. This is just important for you to know to understand what I'm going to share. To get inside, you climb down through this sail, it's called the sail, and down into the sphere that carries the people. So I'm going to just show you a diagram, a beautiful diagram made by the illustrator, Nicole Wong, that shows once you climb down through that sail, you get into the sphere, which keeps the people protected from the pressure deep in the ocean. And that's where I'm going to start my reading, is to share an example of, of sound in uh, the opening. So you start to climb inside Alvin. Oh, and the book is written in second person and it invites you, the reader, to imagine yourself as the pilot of Alvin. So lower yourself through Alvin's hatch. Flip on oxygen. Psss. Switch on carbon dioxide scrubbers. Psss. Two scientists squeeze between gear. You stand and seal the sphere silencing the world outside. So now at this point, any sounds that you hear would come from inside the sphere. You can no longer hear outside. You would only hear what's happening in the sphere or what comes through your radios, your communication to back, back to the ship. But you won't be hearing ocean sounds or animal sounds. Here's another example of the way I make you think about the sound you might hear in Alvin. We pilots choose music for the long journey into the abyss. Will you choose calming classical, energizing hip hop? So in this case, I didn't exactly tell you what you'll be hearing, but I've conjured up some ideas in your mind and hopefully you're imagining the sound of the music that you'll choose to play. So you might be hearing something completely different than what I might hear versus what another reader might hear, but it's another way to bring in the idea of sound inside Alvin. And here's one final example. So uh, sonar is used so that they can figure out how close they are to the seafloor. 9 a.m. As Alvin descends, temperatures drop. Pull on a sweatshirt and a hat. Sonar sounds. Ping, ping, pop, tink, pop, tink. Nearly two miles deep, you've reached the sea floor. Okay, so what I'd like you to do now is to do an exercise where you're going to practice your listening and recording details. And so what I will do is give all of the directions first, and then I invite you to pause the video while you go do the first exercise. This, you will need to have your paper uh, or, and pen or pencil. And if you would like to set a timer, you may. I'm going to ask you to spend about 10 minutes, but if you don't have one handy, that's okay. You can just try to estimate the time, but really try to get deep into the exercise. Don't just spend a minute and a half and then stop. So what I'd like you to do is get your piece of paper and pencil or pen and you're going to choose a place to get comfortable. So you might choose to be sitting in a chair or maybe you'd like to be lying on the floor or on the sofa, wherever you are. Um, one tip for you, when I do this, especially if I'm like outside somewhere, I actually like to lie down and I like to lie on my stomach 
because I can easily just rest my head down and close my eyes and really listen and then pick my head up and jot a few things down. So just find a way that you'll be comfortable um, to sit or lie down. And you're going to close your eyes and really, really listen to the sounds around you. Having your eyes closed stops you from using that, that sense, your, your sense of sight, and it makes your ears focus in. It makes you listen a little more closely. So I want you to lie there with your eyes closed and listen to what you hear far off in the distance. So most likely you'll be doing this inside. I want you to listen far away outside of whatever building you're in. What can you hear? Start there. Listen for a few minutes and then lift your head, open your eyes, quickly jot down some ideas and then close your eyes again and really focus and really listen. If you're in an apartment building, maybe you'll start listening now to what you hear inside the building, but not inside your apartment. Or I live in a house, I might be listening to what's in the room outside where I am right now. Try to hear what sounds I can notice. Same thing as before, then stop, open your eyes, jot a few quick things down, close your eyes again, and now focus in on what you hear in the room where you are. Some of these sounds might be very soft sounds, very quiet sounds. Really tune in and listen. What can you hear? What things do you not notice every day because you're too busy doing other things? And again, quickly jot those ideas down. Okay, so all of this whole process will take you about 10 minutes. So eyes closed, listening outside the building, inside the building, inside the room, jotting down at each step of the way. The whole thing will take about 10 minutes. And so as soon as I finish speaking the sentence, I want you to pause the video and go do that and then come back to me. Okay. Hi, welcome back. Now what I'd like you to do is take a quick look at your list and think about, did you miss anything? Maybe you heard some things, but there's so much happening you forgot. So I'm going to give you a moment. Just think about it and jot down anything you might have missed in that first rush of ideas. Okay, now for this final task, I want you to think about the word onomatopoeia. I'm not sure if all of you know that word. I know that when my kids were very young, they were excited to learn such a big word and what it meant. But if you don't know the word, basically it means uh, a word that sounds like the noise it refers to. So for example, meow, or honk honk or boom. So the word itself sounds kind of like the sound that it makes. Take a moment and see if you can think of some examples in your life. Okay, I hope you had lots of ideas. Animal sounds frequently come to mind for lots of students. Maybe you got things like a cow says moo or a chicken says cluck or something like that. And now I want to go back to the examples in what I read to you from my book. You may recall at the beginning, I said, Psss. so the way that word is written on the page for the way when the oxygen is coming into the room, you can see it written here. It's, it's P S S S S S S S S S S S to indicate. So you know how to read it. And then another one was when I did the sonar sounds, ping, ping, pop, tink pop tink. So you can see right here how I wrote the words on the page. So I spelled out the sound, but also the way I laid it out. It's sort of pop tink, pop tink. It gives you the idea of movement and the sound. And I did that on purpose the way I laid it out on the page. I'd like to give you a few examples from some other books that I like. I have one book here called Raindrops Roll by April Pulley Sayre, and this talks about a rainstorm. And on this page, it says, rain plops, it drops, it patters, it spatters. So this is a rhyming book, and she's included some onomatopoeia like plop and patter. And then she also, the, the words that describe um, action, drop is a verb, is also a word that rhymes with the onomatopoeia that she's used. So this has a lot of really fun sounds. Here's another book you might choose to go find. It's a book called Coyote Moon by Maria Gianferrari, illustrated by uh, Bagram Ibatuin, I think. I hope I've pronounced the name correctly. 
Coyote Moon is the book again. And on this page, Coyote is out searching for food for her family, for her babies. So she's looking to catch another animal. Coyote charges the nest. It's a goose nest. Sorry, I should have told you that. Coyote charges the nest. Geese hiss and dive, honk and snap, nipping Coyote's back. Coyote flees. No eggs for breakfast. So here's a page where you can see these words. Coyote tries to get the, the geese and the word hiss and honk are another example, other examples of onomatopoeia. Here's a, a final example. This is kind of an old book that I just love so much. It's called Hush, a Thai lullaby. And it is written by, oops, sorry. I want to make sure I get this right. It's written by Min Fong Ho and it's illustrated by Holly Mead. And this was a favorite of my kids when they were young. I still love it. And this book, because it's a Thai lullaby, the kind of onomatopoeia that the author uses is different than here because depending on what culture you're from and what your first language is, you hear sounds differently and you might express them differently. So I really encourage you to get this book. I'm not going to read it all, but go see some of the other sound words. I'll just share my favorite one. Well, one of my favorite ones. It's about this elephant here. And the page says, hush, who's that shrieking through the forest? Humpra, humpra, a great big elephant. Elephant, elephant, don't come shrieking. Can't you see that baby's sleeping? So this is a story where baby's sleeping and all these animals are making noise and waking up the baby. And there's a funny bit of information you get just from the illustration. So I really encourage you to go read it yourself. But did you notice if English was your first language, is your first language, you might not have described an elephant sound as humpra, humpra. But that's what it says in the book. And I, that's how I imagine it, the sound is made, but also I don't speak Thai. So perhaps a Thai person would say it slightly differently. So that's a really fun thing to think about. If, you, if English is not your first language, you might have an, a way that seems very unique to me and my way might seem unique to you. And it's all part of putting yourself into your writing. So I want you to, what are, the last task I want you to do when we're finished with this video is to go back to your list. Maybe you wrote something like, I hear a bird. And I would encourage you to make your sound your sound descriptions be be more detailed so maybe you don't know what kind of bird it is or maybe you do but let me just give you an example if i said i heard a parrot outside or i heard a chickadee outside or i heard a robin outside all of those three different birds would sound very very different from each other if i were going to say the sound a parrot makes i might say squawk if i were going to say the sound a chickadee makes, I might say chirp, which is a verb. I could hear chirping, but I would even better be to say chickadee dee dee because that's just the way it's a chickadee to me sounds like it's saying its name. To many people, it sounds that way. Chickadee dee dee. You could write it like that. So I want you to think about finding verbs that are very descriptive of your sounds, or maybe you can find some examples of onomatopoeia that you could use in your own writing. Try not to write things like, I hear. Try to just say what it is, you know? Just say, squawking outside the window, rather than said, I heard, I heard a parrot, or just say, a parrot squawked outside the window, something like that. So I encourage you now, I'm going to finish talking and send you off to do your last bit of the exercise to try to add some more details like that. And then you can go and put it in your writing. Think of this all the time as you're writing. How could you add more sensory details. I practice this skill regularly. I just did it last week when I was out on a hike. I stopped, I spent about 45 minutes really listening and recording the sounds that I heard, not because I was writing anything that particular day about that topic, but because I wanted to practice. I keep practicing training my ear to listen to those things. Okay, so take your list, go back and see if you can add more details and put them in your writing and have lots of fun. Thank you so much. And again, I'm Michelle Cusolito. I'm the author of Flying Deep, and for any teachers who are watching, I encourage you to visit my website, michellecusolito.com, 
And also I have Pinterest boards that will have lots of other really wonderful books that you might want to look at. My boards are built specifically for educators, for homeschoolers, for librarians. So there's lots of resources you can find there, including resources to expand your use of flying deep in the classroom. Um, and there are some more lesson um, ideas on my website too. Thanks so much. Bye.